Welcome to the special session 7 of GAF 8. This session will focus on the shared experiences of women in fisheries by International Collective in Support of Fish Workers, ICSF. The session was held on Wednesday, 23rd November 2022, between 11.30 am to 1 pm at Zeus Hall of IMA Building. Before the panel discussion, a film compiled by ICSF on women in fisheries, shared experiences was shown. The 25-minute film shows a change that has occurred over a decade in different countries across the world, truthful appreciation of women's role in fisheries. Despite differences in society, culture, politics and economics, their involvement in the sector follows a similar arc the world over. The film is an effort to understand and identify the main factors over the past decade that have shaped their role, both positively and negatively. It highlights invisible voices from the South Pacific Islands, Asia, Africa, Latin America and Caribbean region during GAF 8 at Kochi. After the film, N. Venugopalan, Program Manager of ICSF, chaired the panel discussion. Venu introduced theme and panelists. The panelists are Ms. Kyoko Kuzakabe, Professor of Gender and Development Studies, Asian Institute of Technology, Thailand. Ms. Carmen Pedroza Guterres, National Autonomous University of Mexico, UNAM, Mexico. Ms. Cecil Bruja, Independent Consultant, Aquaculture, Fisheries, Economics, Gender and Sustainable Development, Soulfish Research and Consultancy, York, United Kingdom. Ms. Natalie McCall, Gender and Human Rights Specialist, PEUMP, Pacific Community, SPC, Fiji. Ms. Neha W. Qureshi, Senior Scientist, FEES Division, ICAR, CIFE, Mumbai, India, and Tara Nair, Director, Research, Center for Migration and Labor Solutions, Bengaluru, India. The Chair requested the panelists to share their views on the following questions. 1. Can we say that the existing gender or women in fisheries discourse in fisheries explicitly recognizes women's human rights, labor rights, including occupational safety and health, environmental rights, participation in resource management, climate change coping mechanisms, differential impact of disasters on women, and social impacts, the role played by the community and in ownership rights in nearshore fisheries? 2. Are women organized better now? How many organizations are there and how attentive are they at the national or international levels to gender and women's issues? 3. What are the effects of increasing mobility and participation in multiple activities as fisher, trader and wage labourer in the processing industry, as farmers in aqua farms, as migrant workers, as women employed in seafood industry and as caregivers among others? 4. What is a major change in developing coping mechanisms in your country or in fisheries you are familiar with? Is there a marked change at the occupational level? 5. What is the legislative or policy support at the national or international level? Is there data available about women's employment and participation in fisheries? 6. Empowerment and agency of women is important for community development. What is the nature of progress made? What are the major factors of negative impacts? What are the major factors of positive impacts? What is the resistance to these changes? Where does it come from? Um, so yes, I do work on gender and also on human rights. So our project has quite a strong um, mandate to um, explore a human rights-based approach. Um, and the Pacific community has been undertaking research in this area to really um, understand um, how fisheries acts and coastal, fish, uh, coastal fisheries and aquaculture related policies um, and legislation have um, included or looked into um, gender lenses and um, being responsive to um, human rights themes. Um, so I must say that it, it was a very interesting study. It's uh, quite heavy on the legal side of things. Um, but um, the discourse, it really is supported um, to shift the focus and to have this discourse um, on human rights, also in the gender space, looking at gender equality from a human rights lens, not as separate concepts, um, but um, 
So we have really embraced that idea and a lot of the work that we do, referring back to the findings of the study, um, where we still have a lot to do in, in that space. But um, uh, going back to um, the presentation this morning from FAO, uh, I do see that there's a lot of movement and change um, using the Small Scale Fisheries uh, Voluntary Guidelines. Um, and having more debates at international level that is reaching the different regions um, and um, supporting regional dialogues on um, gender and human rights, but also for um, advocacy work. Um, it's been really helpful to look at things from a human rights and gender equality angle um, and uplifting the dialogue through understanding that um, these are uh, the, these are basic concepts that sit at uh, the highest uh, level um, in the national um, constitutions of the, the countries that we work in. So um, it's been a very powerful, powerful tool um, to use. Um, but um, it's, there's still a lot that needs to be done in terms of research, trying to um, understand the issues. It's not a field that always uh, receives a lot of funding and investment, and I think we have had a little bit of discussions on gender budgeting that Venu brought up. Um, so that's an area that, that needs to be um, improved so we can have more evidence-based um, approaches in that field. Um, yeah, I think that's uh, what I wanted to share from what's happening in the Pacific and how um, the work that we do is trying to uplift the, the dialogue on gender and human rights and really drawing from the international um, field of dialogue and um, the instruments that are available and uh, different case studies that we also source from different parts of the world that can help uh, make a case um, for the Pacific region. I would like to share four issues uh, that uh, I think it's very important to note in, uh, when we talk about the gender of women in fisheries. So one is that, as we also said in the, the video, that the women are excluded by definition of fisheries. And that's very important to note that um, uh, we do need to make sure that uh, these kind of policy, policy or program definition of fisheries do include women and their activities. So that's one, one thing. So the second thing that I want to talk about is the importance of gender analysis. The, the, the benefit of gender analysis, it, uh, by doing gender analysis, we'll be a, we have to include not only post-harvest, but also like household work or non-farming, uh, non-fishing activities. These automatically get included if we do gender analysis because we're looking at the fishing uh, livelihoods, which is not only about fishing. They also have to do household work and other work as well in order to live. So by doing gender analysis, these kind of aspects do get included. And that's why by doing gender analysis, we'll be able to improve the fishing management, fisheries management much better. So that's why it's not only that we do gender analysis just because our donor says so, but in then it's because it helps us to improve fisheries management. For example, fishing is a very volatile kind of a, uh, occupation. But then, then in order to smooth out this income, women and youth also do non-fish activity, like uh, being hired as a manual worker or doing farm, uh, factory work, in order to get some income in order to supplement and then smooth out this volatile income. So, uh, so that's one. So it's very important that we also look at non-fish activity. Or for example, fish processing. Fish processing is done in different, uh, different levels. They, it can be done in factories, it can be at home. So, but then, then if you look at the laws that govern this kind of activity, for example, factories are by lo labor law. If you are doing in a home-based work, it's also like enterprise and community development department, all these kind of key people are going to be involved. So it is a very multi-sectoral activity that we are talking about in fisheries. So it's not only about fisheries, it's about law, it's about labor, it's about community development. So all these have to be included. So that's why it is very important if we do gender analysis, these kind of aspects will be included, really enriches the, our analysis of fisheries, uh, fishing, uh, fish, fish management uh, discussion. 
It's also, I would also like to add on that uh, including analyzing division of labor and pushing for flexibility in division of labor is very important because research have shown that households who are more flexible in terms of division of labor are able to adjust to risks better. For example, the, the study in Thailand on IUU fisheries have shown that uh, households who where men are not really stuck to to fishing, but then then he's also more flexible, having their wife uh, also work in other places and doing household work. And so these uh, when uh, in a household where the men are more flexible, they are able to adjust to the this uh, risk and shock much better. So that's why it's very important that we also take note of this division of labor in the household. So so in, in short, it's very important that we have. Yeah, so a general analysis will expand our scope and improve the fishing management. So, so that's, that's another thing, that second th point that I wanted to uh, talk about. The third point is about wages. I think we have been talking many, many, so I think in this conference also many, many people have also talked about how women are being paid low wages, women workers are paid low wages. I think when you have also asked why low wages, how can we improve the, the wage gap uh, in, in fisheries? So, uh, so this, uh, there is a gender wage gap, large gender wage gap, women are paid lower wage. So, so that we also have, uh, have uh, we, uh, we know, we have been hearing seriously. So many times. Uh, the explanation is that, okay, women do different work, well, men are doing harder work, so these are things that uh, are the often given as uh, the explanation of the, yeah, uh, the uh, uh, lower wage. But then, then um, so how do we change this? And then how do we make sure that uh, these are going to be, um, uh, uh, so, but then, then we also know that this is also because women's skills are not recognized. Yeah, so if they are seen as extension of household work, so that's why they are being paid low. So, how, but how do we change this? So that's one other thing. One thing is that minimum wage do help. So that we have been uh, hearing so many times that minimum wage do help and enforcing minimum wage is very important. Second thing is improving working condition. Improving working condition do make it better. So make other men also very interested in coming in. It, it does it does improve the wages yeah, of uh, um, uh, uh, the the uh, the status of the work. Also, the another thing is about introducing promotion. Introducing promotion is very important because in order to promote people, you have to recognize the skill that there is a skill involved and then do reskilling, retraining so that you can improve the skill. So recognizing skills and trying to improve the skills, this kind of uh, promotion schemes are very important for having the wage larger, uh, higher. So one th uh, problem, problem about this is that if we do this, more men will be interested in whatever wor work that women are interested in doing now. So for that happened in textile. Textile, it was all, all women's work. Things are improved. Now men take over. Now it's uh, more dominated by men. So that happens when things are improved. So that's why it's very important that we do recognize women's skills and then reskill them, train them, so that they would be able to stay on in the sector in a more uh, secure way. So that's the third point. The fourth point about, is about women's leadership. So there is the, in the for e leader, women's leadership is very important that we also look at this link between migration and returnee and uh, yeah, in le women leadership. If you look at, if you go to any of the communities, well, in, especially in Southeast Asia, the returning women have a very different kind of knowledge, very different experience, very different level of confidence and articulation. And then they are able to also deal with officers. So they have a, a large potential to be good women leaders. We do have to encourage women to come back and also to, for women to also take a lead, foster them, link them, so that uh, we will also be able to have more women's leadership in the, in the community as well. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'd like to focus my contribution on the first question on women's rights and the second one on organizations of women pretty much in this order. So before I took my flight from Manchester, England to come here, I had a chance to pop in the city center. And there, there was a, a statue of Emmeline Pankhurst, who was from Manchester, 
and who led the suffragette movement in the second half of the 1800s. And she, someone had placed in her hand a leaflet because very close by, 50 meters away, there was a demonstration of people supporting the woman of Iran. And it really made my heart shrink to think that over 100 years, 150 nearly, had separated these two events, but still, civil disobedience was needed for women's rights, for women to claim their basic rights and freedoms. So, how does this compare with the fisheries and aquaculture? We've is civil disobedience still or required in the fisheries and aquaculture sector for women's right to be respected. I must say that after listening to all the, the presentations we had, these marvelous presentations we had uh, over the last two days, my personal outlook is not very good in terms of the extent to which women's rights are fulfilled in the fisheries and aquaculture sector. Uh, you know, it's true that there's been some tremendous advances with regard to women's empowerment, and we had some amazing stories of this yesterday. Um, but these are mostly at an individual, personal level. Uh, human rights are much bigger than this, and the right to decent work, for example, is we've seen often flouted, whether it's in the markets of India, the fish vendors uh, of India, whether it's on the factory floors in processing factories in Chile, whether it's in seaweed plots in Zanzibar. There's a lot of instances where, uh, where conditions are not right and the right to decent work is not satisfied. Uh, but what I've found also through previous um, other experiences is that um, the awareness of one's own rights in fishing communities and coastal communities is low. And, um, and the thing is that human rights don't come as a... Uh, don't come naturally. They often need to be although it shouldn't be the case, but they often need to be fighting for and claimed. And if you don't have that awareness of this right, then nothing happens unless someone does it or helps you do it, such as organizations. We had an example in the film uh, helping um, uh, the, 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 the fishers and fish workers uh, obtain greater social protection, which is also a human right. So this, another factor I think that contributes to, to the lack of uh, uh, respect of, of human and of course women's right in particular in fisheries and aquaculture is that we, we have our own biases and the whole system, whether it's in institutions, laws, uh, customs, um, everything is geared against uh, the, the fulfillment of women's rights. And we, we had a exa great example in the keynote when you know, I did find myself falling for that bias. Um, and, and, and so this is, this is why it's so difficult to change uh, and it takes so long to, to question our own constructs and then make the move to have other people and in particular people in institutions, those people who draft the policies, make them much more explicit about a uh, woman, like Kyoko said. It's not that the women are excluded, but they are not explicitly there. And this contributes to further uh, maintain this, this bias. So, what do we need to change this? It's, it's a million dollar question, but maybe we're starting small with um, um, 
us as scientists trying to build those bridges much strongly with the with the policy makers, the decision makers in the sector, to ensure that you know what what we are trying to to promote that greater equality and equity between men and women is more mainstreamed uh, in uh, in in policies, in tenures, in modes of access to resources, um, and. Uh, a greater organization of women, greater voice and recognition of their agency, their powers, agents of change, can, um, can also help this. And this also in combination with the um, you know, greater lobbying of uh, organizations. As I gave the example earlier for social protection, but it can concern a whole lot of other rights. And this brings me to, to the, the second point, on the um, second question on organizations. We've heard time and time again so far that organization, women's organizations are, are a, a really good way to increase uh, women's power, agency, voice, and so on. And these organizations, they can take, yeah, also, the right to organize is uh, a fundamental human right. So, indeed, let's go for this. But the organizations uh, can take various um, forms and shape. They can be formal and informal, depending on uh, the purpose and the shared objective of the, the members. It can range from unions to self-help groups, so there's a very wide variety of uh, structures possible. And in the fisheries and aquaculture sector, I must say that I am inspired by what's going on in Africa, uh, where I have seen, okay, there are exceptions, but I have seen uh, at local level organize, organizations of fishers that are then linked uh, to national level organizations, often professional organizations, and these are, are very well connected to what are becoming very powerful regional uh, organizations representing the interests of small-scale fishers and women. These organizations, for example, Kaopa in, in uh, West Africa, uh, and were very, uh, along with ICSF, of course, at then the global level, were very influential in the um, drafting of the SSF guidelines. And as we know, the SSF guidelines are very strong on the gender equality and equity in fisheries. So these organizations are really, uh, through the, the, the very extensive web that, that goes through all these different layers to, to convey messages about the recognition of the role and contribution of women in the in small-scale fisheries. Um, so going, you know, going, bringing that message downwards and, and and enabling also those voices, little heard at ground level, to be uh, to come up and be integrated in the the I would say lobbying, but in, in the sort of pressure that is being made to 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 bring. Uh, SSF recognition and everything that it entails to the um, to the rec to recognition of policymakers at wider level, global level. Um, so, so in that regard, I think it's uh, it's good. And I, I you know, concerning a regional organisation of women, OFishNet, for example, the African Women Fish Processors and uh, Traders Network. Is, uh, is very, very influential now. It has established chapters in, uh, in uh, a, a number of countries that is increasing and this is great to see. So it, you know, it is influencing a lot um, in this sort of, of web. And in Tanzania, uh, there is the recently established in 2019, the Tanzania Woman Fisher uh, Workers' Association, TOFA, has even gained uh, recognition and a place in the discussion at policy level within the government. 
and to me, this is really uh, represents the, the, the power of organizations. But having said that, uh, yeah, the collective action can, can have a huge power, a huge impact. But organizations are not a panacea as well. I mean, raise your hand if you have been working in a group and never disagreed with, um, with the other members of this group. Sometimes group dynamics are difficult and creating those units that look at ground level is, can be tricky and not always work. And uh, so we need to bear this in mind. Uh, to promote organizations, not the, nonetheless, you know, there is, um, I would like to point to the new F, uh, FAO guide on mapping women's uh, organization, which I think is an excellent practical tool to better understand. And with this, we can then better understand how these networks of organizations uh, work, what are their dynamics, how power, and how they can influence power, um, they, they can generate power to influence the, the wider um, policy discourses uh, in, uh, in fisheries and aquaculture. But also more research is needed about, you know, the how these networks uh, function and how best they, they could be supported. Thank you. Thank you very much for the opportunity. So I have few uh, points to ponder upon. I want all of you to uh, listen to them carefully. I'm going to give a different perspective of the same. Uh, we are going to talk about common property resources. So we know in India we have a huge uh, potential of water resources that are divided across the aqua, aqua climatic zones. So we have sector, we have marine sector, we have uh, a huge coastal line as well. But then there are certain issues wherein we have not looked with a gendered perspective at them. For example, uh, you know in common property resources, be it reservoirs, be it other water bodies, we uh, have rivalries. Rivalries in consumption as well as non-excludability. You cannot exclude from using it. So here, based on the case studies uh, that we have seen across India, uh, in Kashmir, basically I am from Kashmir, so I have worked on Himalayan lakes, and we have seen that it's the conflicts are not only uh, between the uh, stakeholders. There are multi-institutional conflicts, and of, of course, multi-community con conflicts. So we have seen that the fisherwomen, they are the worst hit in these kind of conflicts and managing with these kind of conflicts. Similarly, uh, in uh, Maharashtra, uh, in the Maharashtra, we have seen in various areas like Uran, Thani, and Raigad that there are intersectional conflicts existing between tribal women and the traditional fishermen. So what, what was happening over there is that they have access to the estuary, but these tribal women, they, their access to those, that estuary has been restricted. So even they have a restricted access to the markets just because they are not traditionally fishers. They are tribals. So they have kilometers away in to just sell their fish. It's only a source of livelihood for them. So these kinds of issues we have not looked at when we talk about uh, common property resources or open access resources. Then another thing I would like to mention here is that in case of lakes, what I have noticed is there are uh, multiple uh, economic enterprises operating on lakes, be it vegetable growers, be it um, fishers, be it tourism. So what happens is that everybody is, everybody is having a vested interest in a particular water body and nobody can exclude anyone else from using that particular water body. So in, um, in the, uh, what I can say, in the trap of earning more economic profit or optimizing their profits, these fishers are getting affected and especially women. So women mostly, as I said, they're not involved in prim primarily in fishing, but in Kashmir, uh, I want to tell uh, this to everybody, that men really acknowledge the contribution of women in the productive as well as the reproductive roles, as well as the community roles. So that itself is a good thing because I have seen that during uh, the course of my data collection as well. And then another issue I want to say, talk about is the customary rights. You know, in fishing coastal community, or the uh, fisherwomen who are 
just uh, street vending the fish. Do they really have the right to sit over there? They don't know. And usually in this course, they are being exploited by the policemen and by other uh, people in the community and they have to pay a price for just sitting over there. So do they really need to uh, formalize those things? And another thing is that when we talk about customary rights, the fishing communities initially, they had a claim over a water body. And in due course, the that claim was recognized by a huge um, a part of the society. So that claim got converted to rights. But these customary rights were never written down anywhere. There was no black and white thing. And even in India, few of such customary rights have a colonial background. Like in Mumbai, I would like to say, there is a, you know, uh, in a, a coastal community, when if you have a small hamlet over there, the land which is beyond that, where usually fisherwomen, they dry their nets or they do some other kinds of activities over there, mending of nets and all, that land actually can they claim? Is that their land? But in Mumbai, under the colonial law, of course, there's a story behind that. That's called as a Gautan legislation. Under that, they have a right over that free holding of the land. Can such things happen in other parts of the uh, India as well, where fishermen can have that kind of a right over that particular area, because there is no uh, document for that, and of course those there was no there were no concerted efforts where those customary rights could actually uh, translate into some legal rights. So I think that uh, some GIS based or remote sensing based technology of course it is existing, can be used to map such kind of fishing ham hamlets, wherein those customary rights can uh, have a base to get converted into legal rights. Then the issue is uh, organizing process. And particularly here, I want to talk about the inland fisheries sector. You know, inland fisheries sector, we have huge water bodies, different types of water bodies, but those water bodies are dispersed. And there is a lot of heterogeneity which is existing. So when we uh, try to study about the women in the inland uh, sector of India, we saw that they do not have agencies through which they can get organized their voices. Now you will say, no, cooperatives are existing. Of course cooperatives are existing, but are they really doing the work that cooperatives are meant to do? No. The Department of Fisheries people are doing uh, developmental activities and cooperatives are supposed to do community organizations, creating awareness, helping people at the local level, but that work is done by somebody else. So what I suggest, what I feel is that there is really a need. Uh, we have done a, conducted a study wherein we have uh, tried to address the human development index for fishers we are trying to study. And we saw that, you know, in inland sector, it's very difficult and complex to uh, get everybody on board. And another thing is that education plays a very important role in empowering women. And you know, in India, in the same village, in the same geographical location, you will see the education status of fishers in general, and women in particular, is worse compared to the agriculture farmers in the same area. So, uh, especially the East India, yeah, uh, the literacy rate is low, and coming to the Indian sectors, it's also uh, lower than the national average. So, among fisher community. So, I feel that education, basic education is a right of every woman, especially fishers. And then um, uh, when we talk about uh, southern parts of India, there is a different scenario altogether. In the Kanyakumari district, we saw that the women are encouraged to study more compared to men. Why? Because the fishing is is an established uh, livelihood for that family. So women don't go for fishing, right? So that is a blessing in disguise for them. So they can go for fishing. Okay, you go and fish and earn money. But women, since they have no role to play in um, uh, fishing, so they to study more. So that sort of things, uh, really uh, such kind of the models should be thought about in other parts of the world or in parts of our, of our country. And coming to the last part is that, I want to say that gender research, you know, we have done a cytometric analysis and in that we saw that from India only 6% uh, 
of gender research. We are contributing only 6% to the total uh, gender research being done worldwide. So, of course, we have a long way to go and we have a long way to contribute towards uh, this. And uh, then at the end, the cooperatives, as I said, the cooperatives membership has to be uh, like there has to be more women involved in uh, the uh, at, uh, at the positions where people are working in the cooperatives as well as if for example somebody's husband died that membership will go to their son not to his wife so this kind of things have to be given an impetus and of course the policy intervention so these were few of my points thank you very much hello uh, in fact, the panel has raised a range of extremely interesting questions and some of them very provocate, you know, very thought-provoking questions. I think a very, very interesting range of uh, issues have already been sort of, you know, uh, uh, sort of uh, mentioned by the panelists. Uh, having sort of sat through some of these discussions uh, through this last, uh, you know, three days, uh, the first uh, point I need to make is the need to locate the uh, inquiries around gender within the larger development imagination, development discourse of India or the discourse of the world. Uh, because it is that discourse which shapes some of these questions and its nature and sub-questions and all that. Uh, you know, the, uh, the, the global, there is, there, is a, there is a kind of an emerging global debate about what exactly uh, development is and uh, where is the position of primary activities like fisheries or farming within that. Uh, you know, of course, there is a derived regional debate around that or a regional imagination around that. And it comes down to maybe the uh, kind of, you know, local uh, trajectories and local development trajectories and local uh, kind of moral codes and, uh, you know, schemes and things like that. So, you know, all this very collectively and very dynamically decide uh, you know, what is the, the out outcome uh, with respect to gender. I think uh, that uh, is, that, that vision perhaps, you know, like, you know, we, because we are, uh, you know, uh, we are very focused on uh, issues of women within the sector and, uh, you know, gender discrimination as a, as, a, as, a, as a disturbing trend within the sector. We generally tend to be very sectoral and, uh, you know, uh, uh, quite, uh, what do you call it, uh, uh, you know, we, we, we become a very micro uh, kind of, we, we start taking a micro perspective. So I think that's something which we need to discuss a little more uh, deeply. Like, you know, how fishery sector's uh, development uh, sort of imagination and discourse is being shaped very, very, very significantly by what the development, what the, what the state thinks as development. And we know that the state thinks as development, the big fisheries, maybe the deep sea fisheries, the modern fisheries, the mechanized fisheries, export-oriented fisheries, nor artisanal and small-scale fisheries. That's not something which comes in the priority of things as far as the, as far as the state policies are concerned. So that's where maybe some, uh, a large set of vulnerabilities actually resided. So I think the whole question of blue revolution or blue growth strategies and, uh, you know, port-led industrialization, infrastructure development, port-led, uh, you know, like uh, development of, uh, so I think we need to, as, uh, as scholars of, uh, you know, uh, kind of feminist scholars, feminists who are interested in gender and development, I think we should have a view on this. And we should critique uh, that's, that that kind of an approach because that critique would lead us to uh, perhaps you know more uh, workable solutions towards what can be done in terms of promoting uh, you know the role of women in in, in the sector. So that's my first point. The second point, I think, some of them very uh, kind of you know uh, indirectly mentioned uh, is the uh, you know the organization of production in the countries that many of us represent is very informal, anyways. You know, like, uh, you know, that's where the, the gross neglect of labor laws. Uh, I think if you really kind of uh, replace fisheries with garments in Bangladesh, the story is not going to, be the, uh, going to be different at all. So I see a worker alliance, you know, a women workers alliance is perhaps what would uh, be much more effective now. I'm talking about the, uh, the times that we live in. 
uh, you know, I think that's another point I need to make. I think we need also we also need to kind of look at historically our struggles in a in a in a in a time trajectory, in a historical trajectory. The 80s were very different. We were actually sort of trying to get women's rights kind of you know recognized and uh, you know like uh, position within the larger charter of rights in most of the countries. We were on the streets, you know, civil rights movement, looking for you know asking for. Uh, what do you call it, uh, alternatives and all that. The 90s went in organizing, mobilizing, you know, uh, thinking about kind of you know, what kind of mobilization strategies we should follow, what kind of groups would work, whether cooperatives would work or self-help groups would work or mutually aided cooperatives would work. So the 90s we went spent, uh, you know, in mostly discovering those models. And 2000s we were actually at the, you know, the onslaught of this, this new kind of development uh, is on us. Uh, you know, from so that that that's something which definitely is go, have sort of modified and redefined some of the solutions that we thought were working. Uh, you know, it's a it's not an abstract thought. Let me tell you that we talk about the solutions in the morning. We ha heard about a lot of solutions like farmer producer organizations or producer companies or cooperatives. And cooperatives in India they don't work at all, but they were working quite okay you know, at, at some point in time. You know, quite well at some point in time. But perhaps cooperatives are not able to kind of you know stand uh, you know against the, the the challenges of the time now. So then you know in fact we, you must understand that we thought about uh, we we brought this farmer or producer company uh, kind of a law to actually break the cooperatives. So we were fed up with the cooperatives. The state was fed up with the cooperatives and they thought that cooperatives had a lot of political intervention and political pressures and things like that. So let's make them business entities and that's how we brought this company act, which is a weird kind of a cooperative with a business vision. But then uh, many of these producer companies are struggling to kind of, you know, match these two, uh, you know, these two visions. They talk about, they, they talk about mutuality, solidarity and also business income. You know, so, so the, these, these kinds of challenges are right now uh, very, uh, you know, very sort of uh, very uh, significant, critical in, in, in a country like India, if I really talk about uh, Indian reality. So then we need to really look for alternatives, you know, what kind of organizations can then work? What kind of collectivization can then work for women? Uh, you know, I think one of the solutions I heard across uh, these discussions is that we should encourage more mixed groups. I would say that we should actually encourage more women's groups. You know, wherever women have come together and uh, kind of, you know, that's where they have been able to actually push through the frontiers because there are no barriers, there are no cultural sort of, you know, uh, moorings uh, around them, so they're able to actually push forward themselves. So we need to really think very uh, strategically, very creatively about uh, getting out of the, the crisis that we are in. First of all, we must understand that we are in a crisis. I think we should recognize that. Uh, there is a, uh, but at the same time, and I think I really definitely don't want to uh, end in a, in a very sort of a, uh, you know, sad note. Uh, the change is not one directional at all. When I'm saying these are the changes that are happening, there is also very interesting changes happening because in our field survey, in places like Veraville, where which is, I would say that which is a macho male dominated, sort of a, you know, mechanized, uh, modern fishing sort of a cluster, we have come across young women who are full, you know, full into, uh, into, in full force into business of, uh, you know, uh, going to markets, buying, you know, like, you know, trading and making money out of it, reinvesting it and imagining and, you know, dreaming of a big business of, uh, you know, uh, around fisheries, etc. So there are certain possibilities the current times are offering uh, to women in terms of because they're educated, they're more aware, they have the technology on their sides, they are more uh, savvy with respect to using some of those uh, technologies. So there are positives on one side and there are definitely challenges on the other side. I think how we combine these new capabilities with the existing challenges and create, uh, you know, newer strategies, newer solidarities, uh, cross-cutting, uh, you know, produce the solidarities. Uh, it would be uh, the solution that I have in uh, my, my mind with respect to, you know, pushing this, this sector forward. Sorry. Thank you for allowing me to be the last one. So I can agree with everyone in what everybody had already said. And actually that's, uh, I, don't, I didn't count the points that I would like to make and I didn't count the things that I would like to comment. But the first thing that I would like to say is that um, 
Uh, yeah, I, I honestly I agree with many of the points that that uh, my colleagues uh, just talked about it, and I think um, I agree with Kyoko that uh, fisheries have to be addressed with a gender perspective. I will say with a gender and development perspective. Why? Because we are talking about a, a problem that affects women at the because of a, a structural problem. It's a structural problem that has to do with different levels of policy and different levels of problems at the micro and micro level. Why? As Kyoko said, it's a policy issue. Yeah, okay, it's like the problem of having like a neutral policy making is that men assume that women are not included because women have not been included in many economic activities historically. So I think uh, one of the problems is um, that women are seen in fisheries or in many economic activities as the newcomers. And this idea came into my mind from the work I'm doing now. Is like everybody in the communities I'm, I'm working now is like, oh no, we are not doing that. It's the newcomers. It's people coming from another communities. So I think in, in, in fishing, like fishing women in, in some places are seen like the newcomers or like in the fishing activities, like what are, we, what are women doing in this male-dominated activity? So uh, for these reasons, there are like major challenges that women have to overcome. And one of the things as well is that, uh, unfortunately, small-scale fisheries in many parts of the world are that in, in the informal sector. So informality and poverty are affecting women as well. And they're affecting women in different ways. So. That's another thing why I think uh, fishers, especially small-scale fishers, have to be addressed with a gender and development perspective, okay? Because it's not only a problem of gender and power relations, but it's a, also a problem of structural economic problems. And then this leads me to another challenge that uh, fishers are facing. Um, one of the things that um, we are observing in a research done in Mexico. I'm leading a research like we interview um, people from 20 different communities in Mexico, from the north, the center, and the south. And uh, well, Mexico is also a very large and diverse country. And I agree with Neha that um, inland fisheries and marine fisheries have different perspectives. And at the same time, I think that these different perspectives have to do with the resources, because. Um, some of the problems women have is like the access to resources, and this also has to do with the scarcity and with markets and with prices. So if there are a lot of resources and it's like there is a lot of income, some, some women have to deal with some problems, like accessing to uh, the abundance of their sources. Like in the sea cucumber fishery, it's like a high value species, so the problems are different. It's like dealing with high income, dealing with what men are doing with high income, and then they have to face a scarcity because the uh, sea cucumber fishery has been overexploded. So now that there is no more sea cucumber, what, how are we going to reorganize? And women have to like uh, invent different coping strategies to reorganize in this fishery and to deal from abundance to scarcity. And uh, women just worry about the spending the money that they earn at the beginning when the fishy was abundant. And women have to deal with the scarcity and they have to uh, become uh, like uh, very good with uh, coping mechanism because at the end of the, of the day, they are the ones who have to feed the family. Even if the husband is just going for a beer, they are left with the kids and they are the ones who have to feed the family. And on the other hand, in the case of inland fisheries, uh, I think there are more problems even within land fisheries because it's like most of the time we talk about marine fisheries and the problems in marine fisheries are like very different and the, uh, in the research and everything. So there is much more research on, on marine fisheries, more attention, more money, more investment. And if uh, women in marine fisheries are having problems accessing, accessing to resources about poverty, about dealing with uh, development and, and informality. Women in inland fisheries is even worse because normally they are dealing with lower value species so their income is lower and the problems are also different. So uh, I will say that women in inland fisheries 
have more challenges because they have to deal with more with poverty, with access to water, to access to resources, and uh, the market structures are different. So the income and the pressure to fish is different, but the income is also different. Perhaps in marine fisheries, the pressure to fish and to export and to earn more money is, is, is different. But um, yeah, I mean, informality is even worse in, in, in land fisheries. So one of my last comments will be that, yes, uh, there are many issues that still we have to address. And fortunately, we have seen like, uh, we have heard about some, some successful stories. But unfortunately, there are a lot of challenges that we have to face. And one of the things will be having this uh, uh, gender-specified policy making. In that case, uh, nobody will think that women are excluded of certain policies or certain programs because they don't specifically say that women are included. Okay. Well, thank you very much. The panel discussion ended with discussion between participants and panelists. Thank you all. Very, very interesting panel discussion. Any questions? Uh, myself, uh, Sushmi Davi, and I'm working uh, with CIFT as a senior technical assistant. Um, throughout the, uh, these three days, uh, it was uh, said that uh, uh, post-harvest is a field where women are very active and in uh, fishing, uh, they are not yet. So I would ask the panel experts whether uh, you see in future a possibility that women can come uh, be the owners of the boats or uh, come into uh, owning uh, the, uh, the, the sectors where they can encourage other uh, women to join fisheries, become more confident so in each of your countries, whether you see a possibility in the future and whether uh, already there is any policy being uh, 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 developed in uh, your respective countries. Good question. Um, I would just like first before I answer, I just wanted to say that um, we do see a lot of issues around stereotyping that still makes us think or divide the labor very black and white often. Huh? So I don't know if you noticed in the video there was one woman from the Cook Islands. She is a spare fisher. This is a discipline of a type of fishing that's really male dominated, especially young men. And um, she comes from a Polynesian context where there's very strong beliefs that women don't belong to the sea, they don't have the power for the sea, they uh, bring bad luck to fishing. So you see women's roads are very much on gleaning, uh, collecting invertebrates. Um, so the, the power of highlighting that there are women who are breaking um, these norms um, is, is there and this is something that can encourage and uh, stop us thinking very much in these like stereotypical ways of what women are doing or not um, and also uplifting their voice and showing that they are not only helpers. I think this morning we heard about it. We have the same issue in aquaculture in the Pacific uh, where we did gender analysis around um, collecting information on, on time and labor and we saw that women had all these activities around aquaculture, but when you ask them, they identified themselves as just helpers because the men owned the businesses. Um, but they were very much qualified to be, to, to be a, a farmer themselves based on the work that they did. Um, so I think that's, um, that's a really important point. Another point that I can share from, from the Pacific region is um, gender is social construct. It's a concept that is constantly under change. There's a lot of out-migration, like the demographic changes have uh, put women into positions, especially in the rural areas, where they have to go out on boats. That was not always the case and sometimes culturally not appropriate, but we do see now women um, going out on boats. It's a need elderly women who are often left behind in quite remote places because there's a lot of um, labor schemes that attract younger people to migrate out to New Zealand or Australia. 
example. So out of necessity, you see that they're slowly changing um, roads. And um, some of the maritime colleges in uh, different Pacific Island countries have seen that issue and have been targeting or putting funding in specifically getting women to, um, to access uh, uh, a boat master licenses to be able to, um, to, to learn that skill and operate a boat. I also wanted to add on to this um, issue. Um, Maybe there will be disagreements, but um, uh, by the way, in Thailand, people, uh, women do own boats. Women traders who have a lot of money, they buy boats and then hire other people and then go to, yeah, so uh, there's no taboo in women owning boats. It's just that the resources that they have access to might be different and then so there are less women. They might be investing on other things rather than boats, so that's why we, we, have, do, we do have less women owners of boats. Uh, another thing is about this division, gender division of labor. I do not actually think that if women start to fish and men start to do fish processing and things will be okay. That, I don't think that is the, the case. We, and then we are not really looking at that. What we are looking at is that, okay, fishing is such a dangerous occupation that you risk your life and everything. You should improve the safety so that other people can also, so that improves the sector. Also, the processing. If the wages are so low, how can we improve that wages? How can we improve that uh, income from that. And then more men would also be interested to come in automatically. Yeah, and then while women also enjoys better. So, so that is what we are looking at. We want to improve the sector. Yeah, not just swapping roles and then uh, that, because that itself does not really save, uh, uh, solve the issue. One thing I would like to say, this is a general statement though. First of all, all women should need to kill the patriarchy within themselves. This is what we, I particularly feel, this is my opinion. So until and unless that intrinsic motivation comes within a woman, that confidence no extrinsic force can break. So particularly coming to Indian context, as, uh, as Madam rightly said, that the environment is not facilitating women to take up those kinds of things. And the most important part out of that is education. So once women get educated, they will automatically get empowered. So uh, I think Kerala will be the first which I can see that where women will uh, go ahead. Of course, with the uh, contribution from the agencies and institutions like what ICSF is doing, I'm sure once that paradigm shift, of course, will not happen overnight, but I'm sure one day it's going to happen. What I think is that there are stronger cultural taboos, uh, you know, uh, against women, get, at least as far as many of the Indian regions are concerned even now. But that seaweed example was such an inspiring uh, example which tells us that neither strength nor skill, uh, you know, actually women lack either of this, you know. So I just presume that, and of course, we celebrate the story of one skipper, you know, getting certification to, uh, you know, steer a, uh, in a fishing boat and all that. So I have a feeling that there may be, there may be, uh, changes in future where, you know, like uh, a, a gradual incremental transformation would happen and we would get rid of, of, of some of these. A new generation would perhaps redefine those kinds of codes, etc. But I would rather look for a more sustainable solution to uh, a fishing where nobody has to go deep into the sea and, you know, and over-exploit resources rather than, you know, you are more aware of what we are doing and uh, you know, the, about uh, more more caring and empathetic about the resources that you're talking about. There, women have a lot of uh, role to play is what I think. So I don't really think if beyond or other than the cultural conceptions about, you know, women's uh, suitability or women's cultural suitability to certain kinds of things, neither strength nor skill nor, uh, you know, no anything really lacks on the part of uh, our women. Well, just a very quick comment. Uh, well, I think we all agree that one of the keys to women empowerment is education. And education is leading to awareness. It has to be awareness not only of, of women, but also men and women. Actually, uh, I thought that a very important comment was one of the comments that Ines made in the, in the video, that women and men have to be aware that of the value of working together, of the value that it has to be like working that of each other works so it, 
it's like women and men recognizing each other's work and women themselves recognizing their own work. Okay. Ma'am, you told both cooperatives and FPOs uh, has failed in uh, achieving their objectives. So is there any alternate option for collectivization? You told women groups instead of mixed groups. So in your opinion, what is that alternative option? Not cooperatives, no F FPOs, then what is next? I said that we have not really, these are all unfinished agendas for us. You know, we have not really uh, been able to strengthen any of these things, you know, like uh, for, for, you know, uh, you know, we have lost hope in, uh, you know, uh, uh, cooperatives at some point in time. And we are not enabling the producer companies to really grow the way they would. Because, you know, if you really look at producer companies, uh, you know, constraints under which they function, none of them is actually making profits as yet. Some of them may be like because larger volumes and all that they're handling, they may be male uh, FPOs. But I have also, I'm right now, I'm looking at the Uttar Kannada, Dakshin Kannada, that region, uh, fisheries, uh, you know, producer organizations. And they're all, uh, they're, 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 there are no enabling conditions other than the, uh, you know, maybe there is a, uh, there is a, there's an organization which looks at you and Nabad gives you 10 lakhs of rupees as one time grant. Uh, no bank is, will touch you with a barge pole. You know, you go to any bank, nobody will give you money. And you are not into processing because you really do not know, you have not explored any of those, uh, you know, uh, higher end uh, value addition sort of things. So there are exceptions, but I'm saying, as a rule, you know, our problem is that we create these kinds of forms, formats, but then we stop short of really sort of giving them enough enabling sort of, you know, conditions and uh, support. That's my, that's my complaint. We have had been having uh, deliberations on different aspects. Uh, so it's a general uh, point what I want to ask. Because we are always discussing about the gender, gender uh, stereotype, uh, the cultural uh, blockage which is not allowing the women to come forward. It is there with, within the women and within the society uh, or in the opposite sex. Uh, is there a possible uh, generalized solution? Because it should be customized. As far as India is concerned, there are so much cultural uh, um, variations. But generally, uh, is there a, uh, an approach what we can uh, suggest? It should be a continuing one. It should be a. Uh, uh, it will be anyway a time-taking one because in most of the efforts, efforts which we take, uh, finally the root cause will be going to that thing. Uh, see if uh, if a woman is unable to invest as equal to the uh, her uh, partner, male partner, she may not be having equal uh, asset or financial capacity, which is because of the uh, trend in their culture because uh, ownership of assets will be very so like that everything can be uh, rooted to the uh, culture cultural thing so what what way what approach in general any anything can be suggested i feel that when the women in fisheries move from informalization to formalization i think things will change i think if you look at the education if you look at the health if you look at any finance sector when women, moved, when, when women moved from informalized sector to formalized sector, things are changing. I think the same thing will happen even with the case of fisheries too, when the move, women move from informalization to formalization, where they have a better inclusion in terms of their participation, I think things will change. I think things are bound to change. If Rega can go on an outboard motor, I think that any, anybody can do anything on uh, Dega is a women fisher who, who won a boat in Inti Kerala, who went for fishing with her husband, but a tragedy happened twice to her. Her husband became un unwell and she had to sell the boat now, even to leave. But uh, I think things can be changed. Yeah. yeah, and I think also in addition to education, which is the sine qua non condition, um, capacity building in terms of leadership, you know, all those soft skills that go beyond education themselves to enable the woman to, you know, work as part of effective organizations is really important. Probably, you know, one of the first steps along with education to, uh, to amplify their voices. Thanks. 
We belong to Kerala. It's 100% uh, uh, literate. Uh, uh, women are more educated, uh, gets employed. But in this context of women empowerment, I cannot say that uh, they are uh, uh, coming forward. They are up to the level of expectation. So whether education is uh, getting, the level of education is reflected in the level of em em uh, empowerment, I cannot uh, say. I think uh, my <laughs> counterparts from Kerala will also. I think uh, you have your own this. answer. Yesterday you said <laughs> digital. <laughs> yesterday you said digital literacy and information literacy. I think the there also, there answers are, are within your presentation. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that is not part of formal education uh, because there are uh, people about the formalization also. When we are telling in the villages, in the rural villages, in the coastal villages, there are so many. Uh, women, we cannot uh, make them under a single category. They are not women processors, but they belong to fishermen uh, families. So what kind of an empowerment uh, uh, effort we can take so that they will come organized or... We now uh, um, consider them or uh, try to make them entrepreneurs. But they are not, as I yesterday told, they are not uh, into entrepreneurs. We cannot call them entrepreneur because they are not passionate about becoming or starting a business. They are forced into that for a livelihood, necessity based. So what will make them uh, come forward? Many things when we are discussing, it will be again within their family, within the community, within the society. That is why I told. And one more point I, I would like to add. Uh, I think uh, uh, since you are from Mumbai, you may be knowing regarding uh, boat ownership. And uh, I am personally, I am not, uh, this is my personal view. Uh, I don't think that for getting empowered, a woman should do whatever a man does. So if men are going in the deep sea for fishing, it is the main thing is uh, more than skill, they, they are physically more stronger that we have to uh, support and we have to agree. And once they bring back the catch, it is in the hands of the women. And in Mumbai, Versova, I have seen women uh, uh, having ownership of boats, but they are not going to the outer sea. Yeah, yes, yes. Uh, that they are just uh, leasing yeah. it out. Yeah. They are boat owners. So that way also women can get empowered. For taking benefits also, like their husbands deliberately give them ownership. Yeah. Okay, and then, of course, they're not having any right on the board, but it's in their names. Uh, so that, that kind of a thing is also there. A very big cooperative society is yeah. there. Yeah. Yes, Cooper three corporate cooperative societies yeah. are there in Warsaw. I think and the biggest, yeah. biggest in India is yes, there. Yes, yes, yeah. And very old also. Yeah. So there are uh, different modes in which uh, they can do. They need not to go to the outer sea, yeah, because that is the <laughs> most riskiest occupation. At least to let them do that. I had two points. One is around the role of the private sector, which I think has been a bit absent in this uh, conference around the responsibility of the companies that employ women and men and uh, how they can um, improve and respect the rights of um, women workers in all the uh, steps of the value chain. And I was curious to hear from the panelists um, what is being done in this aspect in their countries or regions. And the second one is more of a, a suggestion. Um, we've been talking about gender and women's rights as a part of broader human rights and how we can uh, build the capacity of those that are um, learning to work in the fisheries and aquaculture sector. So in the educational institutes, the, the national uh, fisheries uh, institutes here in India and in the region, um, to put some more topics, soft social topics on the curricula, on uh, gender maybe already exists, but um, on human rights, on uh, responsible business conduct for those that are going to work at the government level, at the uh, regional government level within the companies, but also those that are going to work themselves in fisheries that they know what human rights and women's rights mean. I would like to thank all the panel experts and all those who came for the, today's meeting. And uh, very big thanks because I informed some people 10 days back, some people eight hours back. So, but all of them came and all of them spoke. So I'm very, very thankful to all of you. And I'm same thankful to CAFT staff as well as my two friends, uh, uh, Jane as well as Padimal for shooting the thing. 
and as well as Rebo for providing a sound, good sound, excellent support. And I would like to thank all, all of you for coming and doing this. And we, will, we, will, we shall be publishing this on the social media. And we shall also be uh, making a small uh, text document based on the video as well as we publish in our magazine, Galia Maya. It will all come back to you for waiting. And you can add or you can modify it. Thank you all very much for that. And thanks, uh, Gaff, for providing this occasion to have a very good session here.